quick announcement as usual uh, over here. Uh, the course forum tells that for lab four, you can still submit until 11 a.m. on Monday. I will be there on the scheduled lab session on Friday to help you, okay, if you need some last minute help. And for the TA hours, for Connor, usually it's on Friday, 12 noon to 2 p.m. It's being shifted for just for this week. So it will be tomorrow, Thursday, 9.30 to 11.30 for TA hours, if you want to speak to the TA. And my office hour today also have been shifted. It will be 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. on Friday, right after your scheduled lab session. So if you want to ask me about uh, lab 4, of course. But you may want to think about lab test 2, of course. right? It's going to happen next Friday. And if you haven't started the reading about under redo and also the, ch uh, the chess challenge on the GitHub, you better get started. Okay, you can ask me questions on Friday as well. And for your exam, uh, I forgot the exact date. You can check the register office website. It's actually about one week after the last uh, class. So you may want to start preparing for the exam as well by reviewing uh, all the materials. You can also uh, ask me uh, during the office hour. It might be nice to prepare earlier. Okay, so today, we're going to talk about the state design pattern. I briefly introduced the problem last time, but let's review quickly the problem. Eventually, we're going to see three different designs for this particular problem. And then we're going to see which one should we choose. I'll give you some guidance uh, after each one of them. And your job is not just to learn about the ultimate solution. You should also know why the other two wouldn't work as well, especially what design principle you will violate. Right? That's really important for your understanding. So the problem we are trying to solve would be uh, more like a booking system. Most importantly, we talk about interactive system. The system itself doesn't really terminate. You will keep interacting with the user input and then give them some feedback. Depending on your feedback to the system, they might move to different internal states, as we will see. Okay, we'll simplify that problem for discussion in the lecture. Okay, so this is just one possible state for the uh, booking system. You can see for each state, you have to enter certain information and it has to be validated. For example, if you simply enter June 32nd, right, it's not valid dates. And also, after the user has entered every information for this particular page, they can choose what they want to go for next. They might say, I want to exit, or I want to get help, I want to go further inquiry, or I want, or I want to receive a seat. It depends, right? These are the typical uh, things you want to support for interactive system. If you want to actually create a model for your interactive system, the best way to do it, the most effective way that will make sense, is by using a finite state machine, which you learned as a, like an NFA or DFA back in 2001. Okay, we'll see example today. You're gonna get a set of states. So these are all the possible situations you want to support for your system. And also, applicable transitions from each state, from each situation. What can the user do in order to go to the next situation, basically, okay? And this is one possible finite state machine for our purpose, for discussion. And for your particular application, you have to choose uh, your particular states. And one thing to warn you about, maybe after today, you'll be, you'll be very excited to actually see if I can apply the uh, state design pattern to your lab for all the projects. Like for every design pattern, you don't necessarily have to apply every design pattern to every project, you don't have to. There will be a certain scenario that will only apply to uh, state design pattern. So just watch out for those scenarios. You can discuss with me uh, after class if you do believe uh, lab 4 should be applicable to the uh, state design pattern. So we got these states. I'm going to go over them in just a moment with you. And the main challenge really is your number of states might become very large, which means your number of transition might go also very large. And what you learned back in uh, two, uh, 2011, which I asked you briefly last time, n squared. Just uh, keep that in mind. If you really have to go up to n squared, it's just the way it is. You just gotta live with that, okay? And uh, just very quickly about the design challenge. Every time you talk about design challenge, you gotta think about what kind of changes you can make to your design, right? In this case, because the way we model the system is by using a, a finite state machine over here. Okay, let me just uh, remind you very quickly, okay? And then we'll talk about uh, what changes we can make. This is the state transition diagram. I'm pretty sure every one of you should know it, uh, given that you passed 2001 already. This is more like the model of your system. And this one specifically is so-called transition table. I'm sure you have seen that as well. Now, 
transition table actually is also reflected in your diagram as well. However, transition table is a way, is a representation that's closer to implementation. How would you turn the transition table into implementation? For example, what kind of data structure would you need? Can a single array do it? Table, two-dimensional table, right? Two-dimensional array. And for your information, if you want to do this, uh, let's say in iPhone, you can say array two. Okay, that's two-dimensional array. It's a class name. And also, you can also say array of array. That's also fine. Array of array of something. Okay, that's also fine. Okay. Right, and uh, let me just show you very quickly the correspondence, right? Let's say if currently I'm talking about state number one, which is initial states, I might choose to go for transition number uh, three, let's say. I might choose to go for that one, transition number three, and then after taking three, I will go to state number two. You can see here initial states taking three, and I'll end up being two, right? It's a very uh, straightforward correspondence, just to, as a quick review. So now let's talk about what kind of changes we can make to the design. I'll just give you two examples. Change number one, how can you merge two states, for example? If somehow maybe for uh, maybe efficiency of the user experience, we want to merge two states to make, 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 uh, make their life easier. If we want to merge, let's say, state number two and state number three, right? just conceptually. I'm sure you know how to, know how to do this, since given that you deal with a graph in your first two labs. If conceptually I want to merge these two states, right? What should I do, basically, right? Conceptually, you can think about you're basically trying to remove, possibly remove these two states, and then create a new states over here. And then whatever incoming and outgoing transition over here, whatever that's incoming and outgoing, you should also support it, right? Somehow you want to set it up correctly, conceptually, right? That's how you can merge two states. Similarly, how can you delete a state in a similar way, right? For example, let's say if I want to delete state number five, what I should do is I should really delete this particular node, but now where should three go and where should two go into? That's kind of the issue you want to think about. Maybe they should go to other states. It depends, okay? So these are just two examples for you to keep in mind. If you, do want to, uh, if you do want to support the state pattern eventually, you want to really make sure you have a way to update your transition, okay? Because they do happen. May not be often, but they do happen sometimes, okay? Uh, we really want to have a general solution for this kind of interactive system. You don't really want to make your system, for example, for application one, too specific to application one. You want it to be reusable, okay? So that's something also we want to judge, okay? And I also got other interactive system links. You can also check them out. I'm sure you have used them throughout your, uh, well, a lot. Let's talk about the first design, okay? I would say the first design would be good if the only programming language you have is like a MISP. You guys are uh, programming MISP, right? Assembly language, 2021. If that's the only programming language you have available to you, design number one would be fine. But let's see and see how bad it is. But most likely you have more than assembly language available to you. Uh, let me just go over the structure with you and then we'll criticize it. I want to focus more on design number two and three, which is more interesting to compare. The way to do it is by having a superman file or superman place where everything is defined. And for simplification, let me just show you the overall picture. Uh, since uh, if you uh, recall the state diagram here, Let's say we got one, two, three, four, five, and six. Six different states. So that means we're gonna program six different sections in the single place, right? Let's see how they look like. Place number one is called the initial panel. And then we got state number two, fly inquiry panel, three, four, five, and six. So this is the overall structure for your uh, first design, okay? And let's take a look a little bit more deeply to see how each section can be defined. And then I want, at the same time, uh, while I'm showing you, for example, state number three, how it should be defined, think about how you would define other five states accordingly. Think about would they be very similar, would they would be very different. Okay, think about that issue here. So let's take a look at uh, state, number, uh, state number three. 
It's basically like a label and go to, which you did in, uh, in the assembly language, right? Let's say we have a label over here for state number three. And we say that, I'm just using the front until loop since you have been using it uh, in iPhone. So let's say we, uh, for every state to begin with, we display any sp uh, state specific information to say, okay, now you are now in the C inquiry panel, so now you should really enter the departure dates and also return date, things like that. There might be some state specific information to display. Until over here, I want to spend a little bit of time here to talk about the logic, okay? Can anybody tell me, when I say until this condition here, in, uh, assume that wrong answer is a Boolean condition, which means the user's answer is actually wrong. For example, when they enter their credit card number, it's actually the wrong credit card number. And also wrong choice is also like a Boolean condition. Wrong choice could be, let's say the user is in, in a particular state, oh, I'll just be more concrete for you. Let's say if currently this user is in state number one, but they say they want to go for action number one. Oh, sorry, go for action number four. But four is not defined on this particular state. The only action you can do will be either one or three, but not four. So four is like an invalid action to do, okay? So now, can anybody explain to me the logic over here? What do I really mean by saying from Initially, display some message to the panel for the user, but I'm going to go until not, parenthesis, wrong answer or wrong choice. What does it really mean? Justin. It's just until the user makes a valid choice from the state they're at. And also they make uh, the correct answer, right? Yeah. Okay. So guys, the reason I'm talking about this is because I got some students who mentioned to me a little bit confusing to them, so I want to make sure you're okay with that. Let me write it down. I want you to take a look at this thing here. Okay, I'll make it a little bit larger, okay? For now, I want you to focus just on this particular condition, right? Since we talk about until, okay? We're gonna actually use this loop structure later when we talk about uh, program verification in the last two lectures, but it could be uh, something for you to build a foundation now. When you say until, okay? This is the so-called exit condition. which is the opposite to what I call state condition when you do uh, the C family language. You know, in the C family language, you say while some condition C, and then I'm gonna do something, right? So this is what I call state condition, which means as long as this condition is true, I'm gonna stay in the loop and do the execution of the body, right? But now, in this particular structure here, it's the until, it's the opposite. To say, as soon as the condition is true, I'm gonna exit from the loop, right? So now, can anybody tell me, okay, this particular condition over here, okay, I'm gonna do over here, okay, just for your information, I say, it is not the case, right, that's negation. Wrong answer, or I can use disjunction. Wrong choice, not the case. If, as soon as this is true, I'm going to exit. Right? Let's try to rewrite it a little bit to help you understand better. Okay? How can I simplify this? Jordan. In Morgan's law, you can do not wrong answer. Exactly. Wrong that's exactly what I want to hear. Thank you. The Morgan, exactly. So that's equivalent to not wrong answer and not wrong choice. In that case, I'm going to exit. And not wrong answer means it's correct answer. And not wrong choice means correct choice. So that means I'm gonna keep interacting with the user until they actually got a correct answer and correct choice. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep interacting with them, basically, okay? So when you study the first design, make sure you understand this particular condition. Later on, we're gonna argue to say, given the arbitrary condition for your until, can your loop terminate? That's something we're gonna prove formally. Okay, we'll do that uh, later in the course. Okay, that's about the uh, condition here. Okay, let me keep, keep going. And then we say for every interaction with the user, we're gonna read some answer from them and then validate it, of course. Read the answer, read the choice. And also, either the answer is wrong or the choice is wrong, we're gonna give them some error message, some feedback, okay? Again, the error message that you might display to the user depends on the current states, right? It could be that the credit card number is wrong or it could be that the departure date is wrong. Question.
So apparently, uh, it is true, let's say the very first time, if the user, oh, sorry, what I meant to say. The question was, is it possible that the body of this particular if is simply just bypassed for the very first time? Yes. In what case? If the user simply got the correct answer and also the correct choice just the first time, right? But if they don't get the correct choice, the correct In that case, they'll remain to be, uh, they'll remain to be uh, just true, right? You, you gotta set the initial value for these two Boolean condition properly, right? Yeah. Okay, and then let's say after you have been sure that both are correct, you will simply process their answer. And then you're gonna do some case uh, statement to say, depending on what their choice is, if they say, I want to go to uh, st state number two, I'll go to state number two. You can see the go to here. If I want to go to state number three, I go to state number three. And this definitely corresponds to, if the current state is three here, I can either go by choice number two, or I can go by choice number three, right? Depends. Okay, so that's the first design. In some way, it's simple, right? You have a, super, you have a single place to put everything, right? And then, um, where to go for the next state, you simply go to a different label. Okay, that's the essence for the first design. Questions? Say it again, sorry? Oh, you can think about this is more like a pseudocode. Yep, if you, when I say do here, it's, I don't really mean it to be 100% compilable Eiffel syntax. I want to show you the idea, right? So if you want to think about it as being loop, that's fine too, okay? If that's what confused you, okay? That's fine too, right? It doesn't change the meaning, okay? All right, criticism. Now, I do have a summary slide to go over the criticism, but at least we can talk about it, right? Uh, let me just start you with, to give you a little bit of hints, but in the exam, you don't want to be too spoiled by me in the class because if I give you the hints about a design principle, that's not the way it is in the exam. In the exam, we might just give you the design here and then say, criticize it, right? Okay, let me give you a hint just for now. In terms of single choice principle, okay? In terms of single choice principle, do you think the first design actually satisfies single choice principle? You don't think so? Negative. Why? Actually, basically, you're just talking about just, uh, are you just talking about the case statements over there? No, that's not an issue. This case, uh, when you say the case changes, simply means the transition change. That's okay, you have, of course, you gotta modify that transition. Mm -hmm. That's not an issue. Let me give you another hint. Here, I'm only showing you the detail for defining state number three, right? How would you define other five states? One, two, four, five, and six. Do you think they will be defined in a very similar way or in a very different way? That's my question. Ken? Uh huh. Yeah, so that's exactly right. Anybody want to give you an opinion before I, okay. Basically, for design number one, the problem really is, if you think about it a little bit more abstractly, okay, the way each state is defined, we're trying to find a pattern for interaction, okay? Let me put it in a different color, okay? So there is a pattern of interaction over there that will be duplicated from state to state in the following sense. You can see the pattern we are talking about. We go until the user actually gave us the, wrong, uh, the correct choice and correct answer. And for every interaction, we're gonna follow to say read the, uh, read the answer, read the choice, validates, followed by process the answer, process the choice, and then go to the next states. So this particular pattern is going to be repeated from state to states, okay? Now, the consequence of that is, if I really want you to write out a code for state number one, two, four, five, and six, they will look very, very similar, okay? Just by repeating the pattern. There might be some small discrepancies, but it will be mostly similar, okay? So now, what I argue was, there will be lots of duplicates between the state definition. So now, how can single choice principle be violated quickly? What can I change so that I need to modify multiple places or multiple states? 
Anyone? Just one song example. Yes. You talk about renaming the states, right? Sure. That's interesting. So what you're saying is, uh, for example, th that's interesting. So what your colleague just said was, what if, what if I want to rename this particular state rather than six? I'm gonna, it's going to be seven, which means for every occurrence of mentioning six, you want to change that to seven. Yes, multiple places. But presumably, you guys are refactoring tool to help you, right? Another possibility would be, let's say I want to change the way it's pantomized. So what I meant was, for example, let's say I want to read about the user's choice, not really at this stage. I want to read it only right before I try to process them. Let's say I want to change the order. If I try to move this particular line to right before I try to process them, how many places do I need to move? Six. Six, right? Because I got six different states. So that's, again, violating single choice principle, right? Something you want to think about. Okay. I would say that's the main criticism for the first design. Okay, I got other uh, criticism over there. You can go over them. Okay, another one I want to mention is uh, something about spaghetti code. I'm sure you have you heard about this expression here before? Spaghetti code. Okay, uh, if I really have to just uh, to demonstrate quickly, you can think about the way you're going to execute this particular runtime. Uh, this uh, first design at a runtime, you start with one, and then you might go to three, and then go to two. Go to four, go to six, go to five, go to three. Well, people say it looks like spaghetti, right? So it's too complicated to debug. So it's a disadvantage for design. You would like to have something, maybe you can store the state transition in a single place. It's much easier for you to find out the issue, okay? So this is another drawback. They call it spaghetti code. And then we talk about, um, also, duplication, and also people say you design smells because you got lots of duplicates. So, so that violates single choice principle. And also, the way you define the go to uh, the go to labels is also too specific to this particular state transition diagram. Again, you want to put it in a single place, not multiple places. Okay. So this slide here just summarizes very quickly. If you were to do your design in an assembly language manner, that's the drawback you will have, which is severe, right? But most likely, you wouldn't just have a MISP available to you. There should be something else. Okay, it's a very quick uh, walkthrough of the first design. Okay, any questions about the first one? Any questions? Right, good. Let's talk about the second one. Before I talk about the second and third one, I want to give you a little bit like a roadmap, like how we, I'm going to do with it. Okay. Basically, you can think about a second design, which we call top-down hierarchical solution. It's actually not too bad if all, your, all that's available to you is a non-OO language, like a C, for example. You know, C doesn't support any objects or classes, right? They only got modules, they got functions. You can, within function, you can call sub-functions, okay? If you only got language like C available to you, design number two is the best you can get. However, if you got Java, Eiffel, or C Sharp, or even Python, they actually support object orientation. In that case, if you still try to write your code in such a way that it's top-down and hierarchical, you're actually wasting the potential for OO. That's something I want to argue okay, by the end. Okay? Let's take a look at the uh, second one. Number, uh, it will, uh, there will be some uh, slight improvement from design number one, in, uh, which is we are trying to define transition separately, a transition table. And the way we do it, is by having a, by defining a transition query, let's say, for example, right? So he, over here we're saying, uh, let me just give you one example right away so you'll see what I'm trying to say. If I go back to this particular uh, transition table here, you can see if I'm in state number three and I try to take action uh, three, and then I should really get to state number four, right? So now this transition function from the client's point of view, if I say transition over here, if now I'm in three, the current states, I try to take action three. That should return back to me four. So that's the resulting states. Okay, that's how you can use it. And it will be very nice if you write some uh, imaginable uh, precondition, postcondition. For example, you want to make sure every state for the source, it should be between one and six, given that we have six different states and the state uh, number. And also the choice should also be valid. They said we only got three possible choices. And also the target state should also be 
a valid state, right? It's a very simple pre and post condition you can write just to have uh, some obligation, you know, for the client and the supplier, some basic ones. And there's another diagram there to show you how you can implement this transition table using a two-dimensional array, right? So whatever that's blank over here simply means it's undefined, okay? Like that, okay? And for this particular example, if you're in three, and then you want to go to uh, three, you got four. By the way, if you're using two-dimensional array, let's say if you got a two-dimensional array called transition, okay, you can say array two, array two, and then I'll simply say integer over here. And the way you call that is by saying transition, and then the row will be three, and then the column will be three, and then that one should return four. A quick uh, note, um, reminder about syntax, okay? Uh, also, I'm gonna make the uh, source code available to you so you will also see that, okay? Of course, you can always look up the API on Eiffel Studio. Okay, having said this, this transition table is going to be reused by both design number two and design number three, okay? So this transition table is pretty good. We're gonna keep that, okay? So that's what I just said, okay? Now, it's a more general solution because now we've got a transition table. If you want to move from application to application, just change the transition table, okay? But how, how about the rest of the system? How do we define them, okay? What we're gonna see is, this is a top level architecture, well, more like a control flow for the uh, design, but that will summarize the essence. I'm gonna explain to you one by one, but now, first of all, you can see we got different levels over there. So from your textbook, they said level three, level two, level one. Think about level three, it's the entry level for execution, okay? When user try to use your application, they will start with execution, uh, execute session. Okay, let me just uh, talk about it quickly. You can think about this is the top level. We call that entry point of execution. So let's say you try to implement that in C. You will define a function simply called execute session. I'll show you the precise definition in just a moment, okay? Execute session will be the top level from where, uh, from which we try to call different sub-functions. You can think about level two, just a, a lower level. It, so here are sub-functions. So execute session is gonna call initial sub-function first, followed by the sub-function transition followed by another very critical sub-function called execute state, which I'll elaborate a little bit later. And then, finally, it's gonna call another sub-function, it's final. So, you can think about one, two, three, and four. The execute session here is divided into four different phases, just by calling sub-functions. And even further, the execute states over here is subdivided into one, two, three, four, and five. Five different sub-sub-functions. Okay, sub, sub, functions. And when you are studying for this particular pattern, I wanna draw some connection to you, okay? The one, two, three, four, five, the five phases over here correspond to, back in design number one, the pattern that I talk about, right? Remember here, this is a pattern that I talk about. You can review it, okay? So in some way, they are similar. Okay, any question overall before I tell you something very important? There's something that's not really shown over here for phase number three, which is called execute states. Remember, now we are in the context where we don't have OO, right? So that means every time when you try to call a function, you don't have the notion about current object or context object. There's no this or current. The only way we can do it, let's say we want to say, if I want to display I really want to know what the current state is. If the current state is about confirmation, I should print messages related to confirmation. If that's about C inquiry, I should put messages related to C inquiry. So the current state is really important. But now in the non o approach, how am I supposed to tell the execute states what the current state is? There's no current objects. Jordan? You would have a parameter for it. Exactly, parameter, thank you. So the way to do it, as you will see later in the slides, so execute states actually, so execute states is going to take CS for current states of type integer from one to six. And then not surprisingly, 
every sub sub function over here, for example, display is also going to take the current states of type integer. And similarly for read, correct, for validation, message for error messaging and process, right? Every one of them. That's just how you, you would do it if you program in C. You just have to explicitly pass an input to the function and sub-function, sub-sub-function, what the current state is, okay? For those of you who might think a little bit fast, you might already see what the uh, drawback is for this hierarchical approach in terms of single choice principle. Okay, we'll get there, okay? Let me go over a little bit of coding uh, with you quickly so you will see more details. Okay, so now, uh, let's say this, execute session. So what I'm talking about is this particular guy here, right? Execute session, okay, the top level. Let's go a little bit detail. For execute session over here, you can see we have current states, which is of type integer. Later on, when we move to the OO approach, we still got a notion about current states, but the type will be different. Rather, the integer is going to be of type sound class. Okay, we'll see. I just want to tell you a little bit of preview. And then over here, we simply say, again, we run some until loop to say, until as soon as we get to the final states, we should really uh, terminate the uh, interaction with the user. For example, if they have paid, they have also confirmed their itinerary, so they should be able to log out, right? And then the current state is simply assigned to some initial. It could be initial just returning one, uh, state number one. And then for every body, uh, every iteration of the interaction, we'll simply say execute the states. So now, this is really states specific action. And for those of you who might be well into, dive, uh, who have dived into lab number four, similarly to, remember we have something in appendix A called act, and then we say E of type, maybe entity, I forgot, right? Entity can be explorer, it could be uh, blue giant, it could be a uh, yellow dwarf, uh, no, yellow dwarf, or whatever, right? Similar, okay? Okay, so that's about the top level for execute session, okay? Any questions? Just top level. All you need to know is the top level there, somewhere along the line, we have to really call the execute states where its, in, uh, its output behavior depends on the current states. That's all you need to know, okay? Let's go down to the next level. The next level there is more interesting, right? You can see I deliberately try to highlight the one you should really pay attention to, the current states, right? What you really want to see is this. For execute states over here, okay? You can think about the front until loop over here. So this is more like a pattern of interaction in each states. Think about it's more like a template, okay? And remember this word called template because there will be another small design pattern we have to cover called template design pattern, okay? You can think about a template goes like this. The template tells us for every states, we should display first, followed by reading the answer, followed by reading the choice, followed by validating the uh, choice and answer, and followed by error, uh, error messaging back to the user. And then followed by processing the user's choice, and followed by uh, updating the choice, right? It's like a pattern. For every state, it's really the same. Exactly what a state-specific behavior should look like, it depends on the value for current states, right? It's a pattern. Looks quite elegant solution, actually, right? The way I describe it. Any question for this? You okay? So over here, we talk about how you can execute the particular states. And that uh, sub-function over there call, uh, takes as input current states as integer. And in order to execute a particular state, you have to do one, two, three, four, and five five phases. For each phase, its behavior depends on what the current state is. For example, you can see, in order to display, I want to know what the current state is before I can display it, right? In order to read some answer from the, input, uh, from the user, I also need to know what the current state is. Maybe in some state, I want to know their credit card number. Maybe in some other state, I want to know what their 
maybe membership number is if they have one, right? Things like that. That's why for every sub function you see over here at level number one, they all take current states as the uh, parameter input. Okay. Any other questions about this design here? So now I have a question for you. Oh, go ahead. Yes, correct. Yes, exactly. So you can think about when the user try to interact with the system. Well, think about conceptually, right? They will, at the top level, they only call this execute session, which in turn is going to call this one first, followed by this one, and followed by this one. Before we can go to the next one, we have to call this, 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 and this, and followed by is final. Think about the execute session like a main method or main function, right? And every time if you have to go to a sub-function, your current stack is actually suspended, right? What, like a stack, uh, like, like what you talk about uh, when you trace the program by using a stack. Anyway, that's an aside. Okay, so now my question for you is this. For every, oh, another question, yes. Is this something related to the breadth first search? Uh, not quite, not quite. You, you can think about where you're trying to branch out, right? So, well, <laughs> so I guess I don't want to go a little bit too deep into this. Think about when we try to uh, when we first execute this. Think about the stack is over here, right, for your execution. So, execute session is first pu uh, push onto the stack, and then when you say initial is pushed to the stack. When you say transition is pushed to the stack. When you say execute states, again, it's pushed to a stack and et cetera, right? You may use a stack to trace your program, but that's not relevant to the design here. That's more low level. Okay. All right. Now, here's my question. How would you define display? I haven't shown you yet, but I want to ask you. Display is basically the first sub-sub function going to be called in level one. How I gonna just tell me the overall structure? What's gonna be how's, how is display going to be defined? Before I call Justin, I want to see if anybody else would like to have a say. Anybody? Uh, oh, you. Bunch of print statement. I agree, but there will be something that's more important than what you will actually do. But under what circumstances should you actually print a particular statement? That's what I'm more interested. Ken. What you're looking for is that you need to check what the current state is to know what, yeah. what the display is. Mm -hmm. But I was also thinking the current, current state, it could be like a struct or an array of some function pointers, and then you can handle them all the same by just calling. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is you're, try, you're more you are more trying to simulate OO using C, like a function pointer. I would say we don't really go there. We just want to say what a typical C programmer will actually do it. But if you did use function pointers, then you could process all the states. Absolutely. So in some way, you're trying to simulate, right? That's actually more advanced features. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't disagree. Yes, Alan. So say it again. I want to catch you more properly. Well, actually, you know, in some way, the fact that display relies on other well relies on other states is not an issue because in order to dis define this display, you want to know what the current state is, right? So that itself is actually a correct definition. There's no way around. The issue is a little bit behind that, okay? Okay, uh, how about this? Let me be more precise about my question here, right? Remember display takes current states of type integer, right? Give me a sketch about how to define this. Justin, this time. A bunch of if, I agree. So help me out, what should be the first if? If CS equals one, and then do something, right? Do something specific to your state number one. Else if CS equals two, and then do something else. And how many do you need to have? Six, right? Okay, because you got six states. 
else if cs equals 6, and then I do something else over here. And let me fix the code a little bit before later discussion. And can I possibly resize it? Yes, I can. OK, that's display. Yeah, you can use inspect, you can use case, you can use if, but overall it's going to be similar. Right? You have to inspect the value for what the current state is. That's unavoidable. That's my point. You can also use inspect. That's not a problem. Right? OK, so now before I talk about the drawback for this, does this look familiar to any one of you? About only about two weeks ago, or well, less than two weeks ago. Can anybody tell me? I'll be very happy if at least one of you can tell me this looks familiar to you. Anybody? And this, that's exactly why I mentioned that at that point. If you ever pay attention to what I said, I'm pretty sure every one of you did. But I said we're going to review that later. This is the time. Justin. Exactly. Can you be more a little bit precise? You don't remember. That's good enough, actually. <laughs> All right. Nice. You remember this? This is when before we talk about inheritance, I said one way to do it is to encode the type of the students by using something called kind. Right? And given that you're now more in the more senior level, you want to think a little bit more abstractly, right? Encoding the kind of students using a, 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 an explicit attribute here is really the same solution as you're trying to encode the current state explicitly using an integer. It's really the same. So the criticism will also be the same. The criticism we had before was to say, you have to somehow repeat this kind of uh, control structure over and over for every method or command or feature, right? The same criticism applies to what we are trying to do now for the display and read, right? Let me go back here. Can okay, anybody help me out? Why is this violating single choice principle? Oh, you want to say something? Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. You want to change all different spots. Okay, let me, uh, let me set it up first. Remember how many sub such functions we need to define? We need to define for display, read, correct, message, and process, right? Let me just do one of them. The way you do it will be exactly what, like what I'm doing now. I don't think you would just type from scratch. That's not human. What you will do is you will simply copy and paste, and then you might simply just change from display into, for example, read. Right? All you got to change was how this should be defined, and how this should be defined, and how this should be defined. Everything else remained the same. We're basically repeating the checks on the current states. Agree? So we got repetition. Repetition is exactly the control structure we have over here depending on how many sub-sub function you have. If you got six, repeat six times. If you got 10, you, you repeat 10 times. And now, can anybody help me uh, complete the final arguments? Why is this violating single choice principle? Give me scenarios. I can think of at least two, please. If I want to add another states, for example, right? Scenario number one. If I want to add another state, for example, conceptually, you can think about, uh, according to the current design, we actually got six different states, right? Let's say I want to add another state, seven, for example, right? Something like that. In that case, what should I do? Let's say I want to add a state, I'll put it here. The first change we want to do is, let's say, add states, Number seven, what should I do? How many places do I need to modify? Is it just one or more than one? More than one, right? So here, I got to say else if over here, current state equals seven, and then I will do whatever that's appropriate for that. But that's only for display. I need to go to another function there and say, else if, over here, current state equals 7, and then we'll do whatever that's appropriate for 
read for state number seven. So I'm going to do a, uh, more than one places. So multiple ch places I need to make a change. So that violates single choice principle. Let's talk about the second design uh, change very quickly in a very similar way. Let's say I want to make one of the states obsolete. Let's say delete. State number two. How many, how, many, how many places do I need to change? Similar, right? Okay, so now I just need to get rid of branches. In that case, I will get rid of, first of all, this particular branch. Also, go to another place, get rid of this branch. So, again, multiple places I need to uh, delete. So what I would suggest is, when you go back today, review that particular design about pre-inheritance example and see, compare these two, and convince yourself they are really equally bad. They are exposing the same weakness for their design. Single choice principle. Jordan. Sorry, I was just wondering, why wouldn't you have like a structure that like would... You mean uh, like a C structure? Yeah. That, that's possible, so but... That you don't have to... Yeah, we, we just want to say, you know, it's more intuitive if you all know, the, know about the basic of C, and then that's how you would do it, just by a function and sub-functions, right? Yeah, you definitely can actually try to simulate using uh, function pointers and records, but let's not get there. Yes? So the reason why this part is because Yeah, that's correct. So they violate single choice principle because if you want to add a state, we'll delete the states. You should really mod modify multiple places. Any other questions? Okay, let me just go over some little bit slides about uh, design number two and keep that criticism in mind and see why OO can improve this. And given that we already did, uh, let me uh, again ask you, right? I want to go a little bit out, outside the uh, slides. Why can OO, object orientation, solve this problem? Well, more precisely, in the case we don't have OO, we have to explicitly encode what the type of the current state is, either one or two or three, up to six. Why, when OO is supported, we don't need to? And what I'm looking for is some key, like a term that we talk about. Huh? Polymorphism and dynamic binding, right? Because polymorphism and dynamic binding make sure you don't really need to tell you the current object is. When you say the context object dot some method, you will call the correct version for you at the runtime. Okay, but we're going to see exactly how that's going to happen. Okay, let's take a quick look at the slides. Okay, everything has been covered. Okay, and this one just uh, gives you more uh, informative description about what each function should do. Okay, we also covered that. And there is uh, something, some principle over here. Uh, let me try to read it together with you. They said, if your routines exchange too many data, in this case, we're changing the state information, like a state number one, state number two, you know, current state. If you're exchanging it, then put your routines in your data. What can be the routines we want to put about a state? Read, display, read, uh, message, and etc. and process, right? So what that really means is, if you find that you're exchanging the current states as a parameter too much, why don't you make the current states as a single class? and put all the current state related uh, operation, like a read display, into the state class. That's what it's trying to say, okay? The conclusion from this slide here suggests that we have to go for basically uh, another, a third design, in which case we're going to create a class called states. And for cohesion, we're gonna put everything that's related to the state concept into this particular class, like a, a, uh, like a execute, display, read, uh, correct process and method, you will see them be, uh, becoming uh, either queries or commands in that state class. Okay? And any question about design number two? Now we're going to move on to design number three. Okay? Everybody say okay? All right. So now, in order to really give you the directly to the point about really what's the difference between these two designs, right? I want you to compare these two, okay? Uh, let's say this hierarchical top-down design is what we just talked about, right? Main function, sub-function, sub-sub-function over here, right? That's the non-OO design, where you simply say the current states is simply of type integer. 
And then when you say execute session, will, ex uh, will display, read, whatever, you got to pass the current states, right? That's the second design. Now, what we just agree is polymorphism and dynamic binding is going to help us. But let's, before we try to see how to define that, let's see how we can use it. So now I want you to take a look at the third design, right? So this page really summarizes the uh, fundamental difference between the two. The current states is now defined as rather than integer. It's now a class name states, right? And then let's say current state, of course, is of static type states. You say current state dot execute states. And notice that we no longer have to pass the current state as an argument over here. Instead, now it becomes the context objects. It's a very, very important switch we're doing from non-OO to OO. So this is context objects versus here the current state is the uh, input arguments. First of all, notice that syntactical difference over here, right? Let's go a little bit further, okay? How are we supposed to use this, okay? What you will see later is we're gonna have different subclasses of the states and then we'll try to create dynamic type differently for current states, that's what we will see, okay? Uh, any question about a very quick comparison before diving into details for this? Yes? Well, context, well, uh, okay. So, you know, you know when, when we talk about OO, right? When you talk about feature call or method call, you, you, you usually use the dot notation, right? Be, uh, after the dot, usually you have just maybe some method or some feature you want to call. And to the left-hand side, it would be some expression for objects. That's called a context objects. And the context objects simply correspond to, if you know about Java, it's this, right? The IFO is simply called current. Right? Okay, so now this is the third design. And before I show you the code, which will be very quick once you understand the design, I want to show you the architecture first, bound diagram, right? So now you were for lab number three, I will return the result back to you very soon, so for some feedback. But for lab four, for the project and for the exam, you will be expected to draw a diagram or to understand design from given diagram. So these are both uh, important, okay? Let's take a look, take a look. Let's now take a look at the architecture here. I'll try to be uh, as thorough as I can, but let's see this. Let's start with the clients of the state design pattern application, okay? Apparently you can see this is the clients. And this state over here, a class, is basically the top of some inheritance hierarchy. So that's the uh, supplier. And you can see we are trying to put some label for this client supplier label uh, arrow over here, right? So that simply means there should be a class called application where somewhere we say states is of type states. So that tells us we have this particular client supply relation, right? That's how we say it, okay? That's how we draw it. So you really be able to imagine, right? States is actually the top hierarchy, uh, is the top of some inheritance hierarchy. And then for all the descendant class, oh, before I talk about descendant classes, notice one thing. State class is, what does star mean? Deferred, good. Deferred, which means you cannot create an instance directly out of states. But if its uh, descendants classes are not deferred, you can create instances out of them. And the reason that the state class is deferred because there's at least one feature there that's not implemented. We'll see what they are. Okay. And for the state class, you can see under which you actually got another cluster. I simply call that uh, state implementation uh, over here. State implementation. Okay, just a cluster. And then you can see you got initial, you got help, you got all these uh, states. They pretty much correspond to the states you have over here in the diagram, conceptually, right? So now you can see we're turning from your formal model of DFA or NFA into some class design hierarchy, right? That's what we're doing here. Okay, let's see some very important details over here. Okay, I'm gonna make it large. Let's look at a state class, okay? Can you see that I have certain features over here? I got read, I got display, I got correct, I got process, I got message, right? These are the uh, bottom level sub-sub functions we talk about. 
they are all deferred, which means at the state class level, they are deferred. Well, in some way, we don't know how to implement them just yet. Because how to define how to define the read depends on which state you are in. It could be confirmation, it could be initial, it could be help, right? It depends. So that's why at the state level, we simply don't know. Okay, I'll write it down first. So these features are simply deferred, which means at this level, no idea how to implement them. On the other hand, you can see there is a feature here called execute. And the execute here is similar to the pattern of interaction I talked about before, right? I said for every state, the pattern of interaction will be similar. So that means for every state, the pattern of interaction will just be, can, can just be shared. So we only define that in a single place. So now for the execute over here, you can see it is uh, implemented, okay? And now let me just make one more note for you. For the execute over here, you can think about this is this defines the common pattern for interaction. Okay. Notice that only one feature that's implemented, but the other ones are not implemented. And now we want to see a little bit about how things will go together. Okay. And uh, before I go there, I would like to, okay, you know what, let me just go to the next one. So these four lines will just be discussed in the next slide. Okay, let me go a little bit more efficient this time. Okay, what I want to show you uh, before I come back here. Go back to the slides, and then uh, let's take a look at the state class, right? It's not deferred, right? You, already, you have already seen the architecture, so you can already more or less imagine how you can define that. We have a deferred class called states, and then we got read, which is one of the deferred features, right? Read is deferred. And also we got some answer, just some, uh, some attributes for storing the result. Also we got choice, also storing the result. We got display, deferred. We got correct, that's deferred for validation. We got process, that's also deferred. And message, that's also deferred, right? So far we have seen all the deferred features for your state class, okay? Interestingly, there is another feature there in the same class that's implemented. However, the way we implement it is by referring to unimplemented features. If you see what I mean. Let's take a look, okay? Execute, we're gonna implement it. That's why we gotta do embody, and then we have local variable, etc. right? Now pay more attention to the features that we're gonna call in this uh, implementation here. We're gonna say, first of all, we call display. We call it read, we call it correct, we call it message, and then we call it process, right? Let me, not, let me tell you how important it is to see this more carefully. You can see this particular execute feature here is implemented, right? Because we got some implementation for that. On the other hand, you can see all the features here, uh, read here, and also display here, correct, process and message. All of them are unimplemented. Okay, and I'm, let me put it aside. I need a little bit more space later. So these are unimplemented, okay? And now, notice how we implement it. Display over here is referring to some unimplemented feature. The read is referring to this particular unimplemented feature, correct, is referring to this unimplemented feature. Message is referring to it, and process is referring to it. You see what I'm trying to say here? To implement a feature, we, we try to refer to other unimplemented features. Do you think this will compile? Question one. It seems to me it wouldn't compile because in order to implement something, I definitely refer to something that's been implemented already, right? But somehow, I'm trying to do this. Would it compile? I heard yes. Anybody who believe it wouldn't compile? All right. You, you want to say something? 
You, you don't think they should compile? Uh, because of the reason I just mentioned, right? Because if you want to implement something, you better refer to something that's implemented, right? I agree with you. But unfortunately, it will compile, all right? It will. And that's exactly what's called template pattern. But I will get to template pattern in just a moment. Let's see exactly how, if compiler wouldn't complain about this, we can execute it and see its behavior. Let's see exactly what the behavior is. Jordan, you want to say something? You have to have implemented it in order to see its behavior, because you'll have to. That's true. But for compilation, you, you have to yeah. The yeah. But at this level here, since you cannot create an instance out of state anyway, so you don't have to worry. That's why you will compile. Right. Very good. Yeah. OK, guys, let me make it a little more concrete for you. Okay. Let's take an uh, example. Let me simplify the hierarchy a little bit for you. Okay. Let's say I have, at a top level, I have my state class, which is deferred. And then I am going to talk about two descendant classes specifically. I'm going to talk about sit inquiry and also confirmation. So under this, I have uh, seat inquiry and also I have confirmation. Okay, so these are effective. Okay, and let's just write out the feature quickly. So you can see the read, for example. Let me just take two features, for example. Let's say uh, display. Display at a state level over here is actually deferred. Let me take one more. How about read? The read feature here is also deferred. On the other hand, I have execute over here that's implemented. Now, for this particular descendant called C inquiry, given that it's effective, it's implemented, that means every defer feature inherited from your parents must be implemented. Make sense? Okay. So that means over here, the display should be implemented, right? And also the read should also be implemented. And the display over here should be implemented differently, right? Depending on the states. And also the read over here should also be implemented. And for the execute over here, we simply leave it the same. Okay? We don't really change it which, because it's a pattern. We don't change the pattern. Any question about the hierarchy here? I just simplified it a little bit, just enough, so we can do the example together. Okay? Okay, so now we're going to trace the code that I have set up already and see understand the behavior. Okay? Let's now take a look. First of all, the first line I say S is defined to be of static type states. As far as the compiler is concerned, the expectation that we can call on S depends on the state class, but not its descending classes, right? That's what we uh, say in the review lecture. And then let's see line by line. Let's see the first line. The first line here, I have creates C inquiry. So according to our rule, this is OK, right? Because C inquiry is a subclass, what descending class of the state class, right? That's why you compile. What this will do is the state now is now going to point to an object dynamically is going to be of type seat inquiry. That's what we have, right? So at the moment, dynamic type for S is seat inquiry, okay? The contents of that doesn't really matter for now, okay? Just notice that for seat inquiry, you do have some definition for display, you also got some definition for read, okay? Now, let's now try to trace a very important line here. It's the execute over here, right? Now, let's be very precise. When I say S the execute, which version of execute am I calling? Tell me which ver uh, whatever version that's going to be called for the execute, tell me where it is defined. Anybody? You call it, okay, we'll put it in this way. According to dynamic binding, right? According to dynamic binding, whatever version you're going to call for execute depends on the dynamic type for S. In this case, dynamic type for S is C inquiry. So you would think you should call the uh, execute in the state inquiry class. However, remember, we did not redefine the execute feature. So we are still calling uh, this one here, still the same version. So that's why you know 
there's no modification, there's no re redefinition. Okay, so now, first of all, we should know that for execute over here, we're going to call the version from the state class. Let's try to execute that. Since it's going to call the execute over here, right? Let's now execute line by line for that one, right? In order to execute this, we gotta execute line by line. When we reach this line over here, when we say display, now, which version of display are we calling? Are we calling the display from the state class? Are we calling the display from C inquiry? Or are we calling the display from confirmation? It seems like we got three candidates over here, right? It seems like, Ori. Oh, when you say initialize, okay, I see. You are basically say, I can tell you that you shouldn't even think about you will call this version here because display is not even implemented, right? So the only two versions that are actually implemented were display over here or display over here. Only these two versions. So now, why do you think it's going to call the version in C inquiry but not the other one? Dynamic binding? Somebody said that, right? Okay. Exactly, right? So now, because at this point over here, at this point here, you can see you can see S, the dynamic type is C inquiry. So that means when we try to call this display for the first time, it's going to call the version from C inquiry. And similarly, when you call, uh, let's say, the read, it's also going to call the version from uh, C inquiry. Okay, both versions. Questions? Yeah. Um, you know, how about this? Uh, I want to make, um, can you remember that question asked me again at the end? Because I think I would rather continue with this picture here and then I will deal with that. It's more like a special case, okay? Because typically for the state pattern, you wouldn't actually define a version for the feature at the abstract level. You wouldn't, just for the design pattern. But you're more talking about like a special case, which I can deal with maybe at the end. Okay, just remember that question, ask me again, all right? Okay, guys, let's uh, finish executing, right, the, uh, the code, right? You can do the rest. You can see for correct, for message, and for process. They will all call the version from C inquiry. And they will all be initiated from this line here. Let's go on. Let's say I try to execute the next one. Let's say creates confirmation, right? So that means as rather than pointing to C inquiry, it's now going to point to another object dynamically of type confirmation, right? So now at this point, the dynamic type, when I try to call any feature over here, for S, the dynamic type is actually now has become confirmation. Agree? So now, similar question as before, right? When I try to call S.execute, which version of execute am I going to call? From the states, agree? There's only one single version, right? That's a template we're trying to call. So what we will do is, so this execute over here, okay, let me be consistent here. So this is going to call the version from the states. And then when we try to execute this execute feature for the second time, right? Now we are basically executing the same pattern. However, components of the pattern, how they behave, depend on the dynamic type of S. So now specific, let's say for example, what version of display will be called over here? Is it going to be the same as before C inquiry? Which version? Which version? Anybody? Answer? And let me repeat the question, yes. So we agree that, first of all, when we call this line here, so to say x.execute, we're going to execute this command again. And then my question is, this time, when we get to this point to call display, which version of display are we going to call? Confirmation, I agree, because it's dynamic type, right? So now here, this time, the second time, is going to call the version from confirmation. And similarly, when we get to the read, and also it's going to call the version from confirmation. Because at the moment, dynamic type has become confirmation, right? 
Okay, so S here, dynamic type, is simply confirmation. Okay, so guys, I hope now it's clear to you the following. Okay, let me summarize the point you should know. Number one, in the state class, the execute feature is implemented, number one. Number two, the way we implement it is by referring to defer features like a read, display, and etc. What we expect to happen is in the descending classes, they are effective. They will implement all the uh, helper features in the pattern. That's what we expect to see. So that's why you have to really understand very well how polymorphism and dynamic binding work together in this case, right? So now we actually talk about two patterns. One is about a state pattern. The other one is about a template pattern. Template pattern simply means at the uh, the state pattern that we talk about over here is simply you know a single states and then substates right uh, I mean the state descendants. The template pattern simply says in the deferred class you actually got some pattern over here and individual components of the pattern depends on how we define them in the subclasses. Okay, and you will see more uh, formal writing in the slides, but hopefully you got an intuition. Okay. Any questions about this? Yes? Yeah, the template, you can think about, about a control structure, right? To, to be more precise. You can think about, let me be more precise over here. Oops. Okay, so now I will try to Okay, let me just get this one here. Okay, I just want to get you the template. Uh, actually, that's fine. What we are saying is, you can see, first of all, you can see this particular class is deferred. You can never create an instance out of the state class, first of all, right? And now I call this execute over here the template. It is a template because, first of all, it is implemented. because it's do embody, right? And number two, it is a template because display, read, message, process, and correct. So these are all deferred features. The exact runtime behavior, I don't know yet. It depends on what classes are going to inherit from this class, right? For example, if later on I have a class which is going to inherit from this, let's call it A. In that case, A is going to uh, implement display, for example, so that's going to make sure at the runtime, if the dynamic type is actually A, is the display here is going to call the A version. Right? That's template. Okay. All right. So now let's go a little bit further about how you can program the this, uh, state pattern. We just talk about a supplier side. So let's see how from the client side you can use the state pattern. Right? Okay. So that's the uh, lines I just talked about. Okay. You can uh, go over them. So now. In order to understand how the client is going to use the state pattern, you have to understand this particular runtime structure. Okay, I'll go over that with you. This is so-called polymorphic collection, which we did review in the inheritance lecture. In our case, we say student management system has a polymorphic array with resident students and also non-resident students. And now, in order to use the state pattern, we have a polymorphic array of states. Right? Because states has uh, six different descending classes, right? Uh, let me just tell you the overall structure very quickly, and then we'll go over uh, some example. Okay? Basically, you can see, again, this is the conceptual model you should have. There's a state transition diagram. Okay? And then this guy here is the uh, runtime structure for your uh, clients. Okay? You can see there is a classical application, and then there are two components, right? We talked about transition table before, so we still keep it in the third design. The transition table, which is two-dimensional array, for example, encodes all the valid transitions from state to state. That one's easy. However, this is the interesting bit. Okay, I'll, I'll write it out more explicitly. Here we say there is, in the application, there is a variable or attribute it's called states of type array of states. Right? We actually reviewed this briefly uh, on Monday. Okay? The consequence of defining, declaring states being an array of states is this. States at position 1 has static type states. Dynamically, it can be any of the descending classes of states. 
right? That's why, you see, over here, you can think about states 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All their static type is simply just states. Dynamically, it can be initial, can be flight inquiry, C inquiry, reservation, confirmation, and final. So these are dynamic types. Okay, that's why it's called polymorphic. Okay. Polymorphic collection. So now, what we want to see is exactly how to manipulate this particular array. Okay, we're gonna see that very quickly. Okay, the idea would be, we're still going to declare, let me show you the usage very quickly, right? And then I'll trace the code together with you. We basically, basically got current states, right? States. And then, current states might be changed, for example, to states at position two. And current states might be changed to the states array at position four. Right? We might change that. However, because every element in the array contains some object that's of different dynamic type, so the behavior will be different. So now, if you think about what's gonna happen, if I try to say, for example, CS dot display. Okay, let me make a little bit more space over here. Okay, let me just put another one here. Let's say CS dot display. A very quick check for everybody, one and two. Which version of display is it gonna call from one? Which version? Flight inquiry, exactly, right? Hopefully you're able to trace it, right? So now you can see four, because CS is assigned to state number two, uh, states at position two. Position two is here, which is pointing to flight inquiry. So at this point, dynamic type is uh, flight inquiry. So it's going to call the version from flight inquiry. What about two? Which version? Flight inquiry is still, or something different? Reservation, exactly, right? Hopefully you can see the diagram, right? That's exactly how clients is going to manipulate the, uh, the states, okay? Let me just write it down for completeness, okay? So now for this one, states, after this, dynamic type will just be, uh, let me use a different color. What that would be is dynamic type would be a reservation. Okay, so that means it's going to call the version from reservation, right? Keep that in mind, okay? Now, what we, what's left for the state pattern would be, we're gonna trace the code a little bit in order to see, okay? Um, let me just spend one minute on this quickly, and then I will finish that properly next time in about 10 minutes, next time, okay? Basically, when you actually review the client code over this, right? Let me just tell you very quickly the skeleton of this client code. You can think about this part over here is for the initialization for the clients. They basically have to, first of all, create an application for interactive system, maybe booking system. And then they have to put in all the states, like over here, right? They wanna say a, at position one, it should be initial. At position two, it should be flight inquiry, right? And then they have to also make what the initial state is. It could be state one, it could be state two. And then they have to put in all the transition in a way that, that, that's going to set up this particular transition table, right? And then finally, I'll just mention that quickly now. You can see that the client is actually going to say the current states, which was declared to be states, it might be assigned to different position of the um, polymorphic collection array. But how exactly do we update the transition? For example, if the current state, let's say just for, for one more example, okay? If the current state is simply pointing to, let's say, state number one, okay? Position one, basically. Let's say current states, which is one. If I want to make a transition by taking, let's say, I want to make some correspondence. Initial here, and then I want to take action three. Right? I should be ending up with state number two. I want to take uh, action three. How do I know the index to updates? I need to look up the transition table. What I need to do is I'm gonna say transition, and then the current state is simply just one initial, taking action three, so one and three, I'll go to two. So this returns two. 
So this tells me I should really update the current states rather than index one. You should now point to index two of this particular uh, array elements, right? So this will be the new current states. Okay, I will just stop here and then we'll continue to finish this up on next Monday.